Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for the blood of your Son that cleanses us from all sin. We thank you for the cross, Lord God, and for the eternal truth of your word and your spirit that leads us into all truth. Lead us into that truth now, Lord God, but let it not increase our knowledge with the aim of increasing our knowledge, but increasing our knowledge with the aim of making us more conformed to the image and likeness of your Son and more effective in serving him and helping others in his name, the name in which we pray, the Lord Jesus. Amen. A discernment conference, learning to discern. There are many aspects of discernment. When discernment ministry began, it was probably begun in the modern sense, in the modern sense, by Dr. Walter Martin. Only then it was pretty straightforward. It was apologetics and evangelism to people in cults. How to refute Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, things like that. It's pretty straightforward. When Dr. Martin was still with us. Then the Lord raised up Dave Hunt, who's now gone home. Things changed. You needed apologetics, discernment. Not to evangelize or to refute those outside the church in cults. But now the church itself was being infiltrated, even invaded by heretics, word, faith, money preachers, etc. Now it's in the church. One aspect of discernment is the discernment that every believer is called to know. To judge by the scriptures in the light of the Holy Spirit's guidance, if or not a belief or practice is scriptural. Every believer can have that kind of discernment. Then there's the gift of discerning of spirits. That's something else. Some have that gift, some don't. But when we deal with discernment, there is an often overlooked area of discernment. Most Christians don't even think about it, I wouldn't think. But it's something we should all think about. When the Jehovah's Witnesses come to the door... And they begin telling you Jesus is not God and the resurrection has no historicity. He really didn't raise from the dead. You know that that's a person who's deceived by Satan. And you know Satan is speaking through those cults. That's no problem identifying the voice of Satan when he speaks through cults. But where it gets complicated. How do you know when Satan is speaking through Christians? How do you know when Satan is speaking from the pulpit? How do you know when Satan is speaking within the body of Christ? Indeed, how can we be sure in a given instance, Satan is not speaking through us? We're not talking here about demonic possession. But spirits motivate us. They can put thoughts in our heads. Before we turn to our main text, turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16. We'll begin at verse 21. From that time, Jesus Christ, when the scriptures say Jesus Christ, it's him on earth. When it says Christ Jesus, it's him in eternity. Christ Jesus is him in eternity. Jesus Christ is him on earth. Depending on the context, is the scripture calling him Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ? Son of God is him in eternity. Son of man is him on earth. The scriptures never speak of the return of Jesus as the son of God, always as the son of man. Let's look. That Jesus Christ must begin to show his disciples he must go up to Jerusalem. or must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Satan, get thee hence. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Now, just a few verses earlier, Jesus says that the Father revealed something to the same Peter, Shimon Bariona, as we looked at this morning. 
I say to you that you are Peter. And the reason he tells them this is that uh, the Father revealed this to you. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you. My Father did. Now, of course, the rock in the Greek, we have Petra and Petros. Peter is the Petros, not the Petra. 1 Corinthians 3, Jesus is the Petra. He's the foundation of the church, not Peter. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church hid behind the Latin Cephas in the Vulgate, which is the Latinization of Kaifa from the Aramaic. But in the original Greek, obviously, the rock is Jesus. None of the Roman Catholic early church fathers, none of them, including the two most important ones, Jerome, who translated the Vulgate, and Augustine of Hippo, both of them denied that Peter was the rock. And of course, when you confront the Roman Catholic priest with this, he's got a problem. The stuff of Peter being the rock came with Gregory the Great, not with the church fathers and certainly not with the apostles of the text. The Father revealed this to you. In one instance, God is speaking directly through Peter. Caiaphas Shmoni, we call him in Hebrew. God's speaking through him. A few minutes later, the devil is speaking through him. We're not talking about satanic or demonic possession. But something comes into his head. We see this in James. With the same tongue, we praise God and say some things we shouldn't. How do you know when the devil is speaking through a believer? They may be very sincere. Peter could not have been more sincere. He had no idea, no concept that the devil was speaking through him. Now let's understand the background. Let's see some living. We know as believers... There's one Messiah, two comings. We have two diverse pictures of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Even the rabbis recognize this. They call it Hamashiach ben Yosef and Hamashiach ben David, Messiah, son of Joseph, Messiah, son of David. The rabbis concluded, at least some of them in the Talmud, that there's two Messiahs. One a suffering servant in the character of Joseph from the book of Genesis, and one a conquering king like David. The suffering servant is called Ben Ephraim in the rabbinic literature, and he's identified with the suffering servant of Isaiah 52 and 53. Messiah, son of Joseph, Hamashiach Ben Yosef. Very briefly. Joseph was betrayed by his Jewish brothers into the hands of Gentiles. God took that betrayal and made it a way for Israel and all the world to be saved. So Jesus, the son of Joseph, and it was providential and fortuitous that his foster father's name was Joseph. Yosef, he shall add. Jesus was betrayed by his Jewish brothers into the hands of Gentiles. God took that betrayal and turned it around and made it a way for all Israel and all the world to be saved. Joseph was condemned with two criminals, and as he prophesied, one would live, one would die. Jesus, the son of Joseph, is condemned with two criminals, and as he prophesied, one would live, and as it were, one would die. Joseph went from a place of condemnation to a place of exaltation in a single day in Genesis. So Jesus went from a place of condemnation to exaltation in a single day. Upon exaltation, Joseph takes a Gentile bride. Upon exaltation, Jesus, in figure, takes a Gentile bride, the church. They bring Joseph's cloak to prove he's not in the pit as they bring Jesus' shroud to prove he's not in the tomb. Joseph was, of course, betrayed by his brother Yehuda, Judas, for 20 pieces of silver. After inflation, Jesus was betrayed by Yehuda, Judas, for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him at the first coming. They recognized him at the second and wept bitterly. So Jesus' brothers, the Jews, most will not recognize him at the first coming. Zechariah 12 tells us they'll recognize him at the second and we bitterly. Jesus made it very clear the Jews must be in Israel and must be in Jerusalem for him to return. Jeremiah 23, I'm sorry, Matthew 23, 39, 
Zechariah 12, 1 to 10, Luke 21, 24. When you see somebody telling you contemporary events in the Middle East don't fulfill prophecy, they're a false teacher. They're deceived. They're at best ignorant. These things fulfill prophecy. The Jews must be in Jerusalem for Jesus to return. Do not let any false teacher tell you otherwise. Now I'll tell you something about Israel and prophecy. Replacement theology is false. If somebody is right about Israel, that does not prove that they're right about other things. If you go to some of these messianic conferences, there's crazy people lifting up Jewishness instead of Jesusness. There's people putting Gentiles under the law. There's all kinds of lunacy. For sure. I warned about this all the time. Being right about Israel does not prove somebody's right about other things. But if somebody's wrong about Israel, I guarantee you they're wrong in their other doctrine. I've never known a single Christian author, theologian, scholar, pastor who was replacement theology who was not teaching other error. John Stott in England. Anti-Israel, caught annihilationism. We can't say there's a such place as hell. Then he went down the ecumenical road. John Piper, cheerleader for Rick Warren. Go on YouTube watching him leading the Lectio Divina with Beth Moore, New Age Visualization. He's a screwball. He's always been a screwball, but he's replacement theology. If they're wrong about Israel, they're wrong about other things. Israel is a litmus test. Being right about Israel doesn't prove they're kosher, but being wrong about Israel proves they aren't. They're not worth listening to. If somebody's replacement theology, their reading of the scripture is fundamentally wrong, they're supersessionists, they're not worth paying any attention to whatsoever. Satan must displace the Jews from Israel and Jerusalem in order to try to preempt, prevent the return of Christ. He won't succeed, but he will try. This is the meaning of Zechariah 12. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. No! The Messiah must come back. Not as the son of Joseph, the suffering servant. That's his first coming. He must come as the son of David and set up the millennial kingdom. Second point. For Jesus to be the Christ, Yeshua must be the Messiah. If Yeshua is not the Messiah, Jesus is not the Christ. For Yeshua to be the Messiah, he must fulfill all of the Old Testament prophecies. Both the suffering servant prophecies and the conquering king prophecies. Both the son of Joseph prophecies and the son of David prophecies. The early church, the apostolic church, the pre-Nicene church was premillennial. If there's no millennial reign of Jesus, he's not the Messiah. Do not believe this amillennial, postmillennial garbage. It's an invention of Gentile Christianity at a much later point after Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire. It was not the belief of the apostles in the early church. There must be a millennium. Jesus must fulfill all those prophecies. In his first coming, he's only fulfilled the son of Joseph prophecies. When he comes back, he'll fulfill the son of David prophecies. Now, there's more to it than this, but that's the nutshell version. You can get my book out there, The Final Words of Jesus. We go into it at some depth. But let's understand this. The Jews of Jesus' day, though, didn't see this. They thought they were going to have a Messiah in the character of the Maccabees, who'd get rid of the Romans the way the Maccabees had gotten rid of the Greeks about 160 years earlier. So you see Jesus celebrating Hanukkah in John chapter 10. Your Bible calls it the Feast of Dedication, but in Hebrew it's Hanukkah. They didn't understand. John the Baptist, Johanan Matbil, even he didn't understand. He sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? How can you be both the suffering servant and the conquering king? Even after the resurrection, the apostles didn't get it. Acts chapter 1, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom? Restore the kingdom to Israel. Are you going to be the Davidic Messiah? One Messiah, two comings. The two views became conflated in the time of Jesus, the second temple period. They had the idea the Messiah was going to come and set up the kingdom. 
And so on Palm Sunday at the triumphal entry, they're all singing the Hallel Rabbah to Yeshua when he comes through the East Gate. Part of the Matzor, the Hebrew festival liturgy to this day. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, barach nuhem mi beit Adonai, hodula Adonai kito, ki le'olam hazdo. Hoshana, Hoshana the Ben David, Hosanna, O oh save us, son of David. Quite a story, isn't it? The Levites were leading the procession, and as the Levites leading the procession came through the east gate, they would strike up the chorus from the Hillel Rabbah, Psalm 118. Look at Psalm 118. See what they were singing. Verse 25, O Lord, do save in Hebrew, Hosanna, Hoshana. O Lord, we beseech thee, send prosperity now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. A few days later, 72 hours later, perhaps Jesus says to Jerusalem, you won't see me until you say Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Why? They were saying, blessed is he who comes in the Lord, name of the Lord to the son of David. They should have been saying it to the son of Joseph, the suffering servant who was going to die for their sin. You understand? Psalm 118. There is Psalm 118. Yes, I'm sure there is a Psalm 118. You understand the background. Look what it says. Give us prosperity now. There were three reasons most Jews were not ready for his first coming. One, dominion theology. Kingdom now theology. John Wimber theology. Gerald Coates theology. Ichthus theology. We're going to conquer the world for Christ before he comes set up his kingdom. A combination of charismania and hyper-Calvinistic reconstructionism. Kingdom now theology. That's the first reason. They wanted a political messiah who was going to give them the kingdom then. Second reason. Nesim v'niflaot. They wanted a messiah who was going to put on a show. The only thing Jesus would have had to do was put on a show for Herod and he wouldn't have been crucified. Jesus said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. When you see this, when you see people flocking into arenas to see that stuff, that is a wicked and an adulterous generation. Scripturally, it is these signs Follow. Faith does not come by seeing miracles. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. The signs follow evidentially. The Antichrist and false prophet are going to put on a show. Notice when Jesus healed somebody. Shh. Keep that to yourself. Don't tell anybody. I got your cup. Makes the paralytic walk at the pool of Bethesda, John 5. Hallelujah, he's walking. Sin no more. Jesus had miracles, but he never had a miracle crusade. He left that to Kenny and Benny and the other false prophets he warned about. Jesus had healings. And his healings, unlike Todd Bentley's, your homeboy, his could be medically documented. <laughs> he had healings, but he never had a healing crusade. <laughs> Second reason most Jews were not ready for him to come, they had a signs and wonders vineyard theology. In addition to their kingdom now theology. Third one, give us prosperity now. 
You're a king's kid. God wants you rich. Blame it and name it and claim it. Hallelujah. Blab it and grab it. Yes, friends, I want each and every one of you. Now open up your heart and open up your wallet and show me how much you love the Lord Jesus. Can you say amen? <laughs> Kingdom now theology, signs and wonders theology, word, faith, prosperity theology. Those same three lies of the devil is why most Jews were not ready for him to come the first time. You understand? And it's those same three reasons. So many people who claim to be saved Christians are not going to be ready for him to come again. They had a presupposition. This is what's going to happen when the Messiah comes. You're not going to suffer. <laughs> I speak in Indonesia, the most populous Muslim country in the world. A midweek, a midweek meeting under the equator, sweltering heat. Thousands of people. Thousands crowding into a church that's been attacked multiple times to hear the word of God for a midweek Bible study. I go to Vietnam. Those people are persecuted. The Hmong people, the mountain people, the Montagnards, they're persecuted. Their pastors are tortured. But their churches are growing. This is Laodicea. You don't have to suffer. You're a king's kid. If you suffer, you don't have anything. We're going to be raptured out of here. Don't you know Christians in British Columbia and Devonshire, England and Virginia are different than the Christians in Islamic and communist countries? We're going to be raptured out of here before we suffer. Oh, no, 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 no. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. <laughs> you will have philipsis in the world. You will not have orge, wrath. The faithful church will not experience the wrath of God, but it will certainly experience tribulation. Oh, no, we rebuke that. We're going to be out of here. He's coming tonight, two minutes to come tomorrow. Jesus can come tonight for me. He can come tonight for you. He can come at any moment for any one of us. But he's not coming for the church until the faithful church can identify the Antichrist. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. They can do all the monkey tricks and somersaults they want. But he who has wisdom, count the number of the beast. If Jesus is our wisdom and we're not here, who's going to count the number? Oh, that's the tribulation saints. If they had wisdom, they wouldn't be here either. It was a presupposition. Peter said, no, Jesus, I know you're the Messiah and everything, but it's not going to be like that. Listen to me. I'll straighten you out. And Jesus tells him, Satan, get thee hence. He's coming for a spotless bride. The church has become so compromised and worldly, and in many cases heretical, persecution has become a necessary evil. You understand? Now the problem with persecution is those who don't need to be persecuted get it first and worse, but it will clean up Laodicea. And I'm not looking forward to persecution. I go to enough countries where there is persecution. Already in Canada, they find they find one pastor fifteen thousand dollars for preaching in his church from Romans chapter one because of what it said about homosexuality. This is the beginning. This is Canada. Satan spoke through Peter. He had no idea. The Lord speaks to him one moment. Oh, God spoke through Peter. Two minutes later, or right the next thing we see, it's the devil speaking. God can speak through a pastor, through a preacher, through an evangelist. He can speak right into your life by the Holy Spirit through some man of God. Yes. And five minutes later, ten minutes later, the devil can put words in his mouth. Not necessarily in his heart, 
but in his mind. The name of our ministry is Moriel. Somebody asked me, Moriel in Hebrew, God is my teacher. Jacob Prash is not your teacher, you understand? Chew the cud, as we looked at earlier today. Trust Jesus. Nobody else, especially yourself. Because God speaks to a pastor or a teacher does not mean he's always going to get it right. Even if the motives of his heart are right, that does not mean what he's saying is right. Remember what we said earlier about Sadek and Sadik? Let's look. With this background in view, turn with me to the trials of Jesus, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 18. The signatures of Satan. Although it may be a brother or a sister saying it, or writing it, or teaching it, or prophesying it, or whatever. How do you know it's not the devil? Or more importantly, how do you learn to discern it is? Jesus had three trials. One religious, one civil, and one criminal. His Herodian trial before Herod was a civil procedure to determine jurisdiction. His trial before the Sanhedrin was religious, but they did not have the authority to capitally execute. Then there was the imperial trial before Pilate. In 1970, Haim Cohen, the president of the Israeli Supreme Court, conducted a judicial inquiry forensically into the trials of Jesus. Purely as an academic exercise. This is the unsaved Jewish president of the Israeli Supreme Court in 1970. The conclusion of the judicial inquiry? Purely academic. The trial of Jesus was illegal by both Roman and Jewish law. He never should have been convicted. In fact, he never should have been put on trial. The indictment itself was bogus. He was, of course, put on trial in our place. He was executed for those things of which we are guilty. And so we see what happens. Verse 25, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and then therefore they said to him, you're not also one of his disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? To cut off the ear. As long as he was positive, Jesus was going to depose the Romans, get rid of the Sanhedrin, and set up the Messianic kingdom, Peter was all brave. Look out, Jesus! I'll get him! But when he found out it wasn't going to be that way, that his eschatology, as it were, was wrong, his confidence corroded quickly. That is going to happen in the last days. People who believe false eschatologies like pre-trib, when reality hits them in the face, it's going to corrode. Now let's understand this even further. Chop off the ear. What does that mean? Some of my closest friends, by the way, some of my closest brothers in Jesus are preaching. I don't make it a basis of fellowship. I would never divide over it. I'm simply saying it's not scriptural. He's coming between the sixth and seventh seal, but that's another issue. First signature of Satan. This is something every one of us has done. 
Every Christian has done this at some point. Chopping off the ear. When we speak to a new believer, a young believer, Paul says, use makrotumia. Correct them with great patience and instruction. When you speak to an unsaved person, don't expect them to think like a believer or respond to what you say. They must be convicted of their sin by the Holy Spirit. And a klenktos, as we say is in Greek, must take place. Dealing with new believers and unsaved people is one thing. Jesus was very gentle with the lambs. He was very forgiving and open towards non-believers when he could be. But with religious hypocrites, that's when he got forceful. <laughs> treat the sheep one way, treat the wolves who malign the sheep, mislead the sheep another. We had one last night doing a hatchet job on, on, on Brother Barger. It's terrible. He answered his question three times, just wouldn't leave him alone. Save the sword. But when you need it. But every one of us has misused the sword at some point. You may say something that is in principle true. That may be doctrinally correct. But you chop the ear off with the sword. You make it impossible for them to hear. You understand? I know of cases in my experience as an evangelist to the Jews where people have said to Jewish people, even Jewish people with family who died in the Holocaust, and they've said stuff like this. You know, God loves the Jewish people. It's too bad you're going to hell because you don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. It's a true statement. In principle, it's true. It's doctrinally valid. But an unsaved Jew hears that. That's just anti-Semitism to them. Even if it's not intended that way, whoosh, you chopped off their ear. I will talk about Roman Catholicism to you directly. But if I'm trying to witness to a Roman Catholic, I'm not going to tell them it's the whore of Babylon and Christian masquerade. <laughs> I'll tell you that because that's what it is. You just chop off the ear. At some point, virtually every one of us has chopped off somebody's ear with the sword, haven't we? If there's a Christian who has not chopped off somebody's ear with the sword and made it impossible for them to hear the truth, I never met them. Jesus put the ear back on, remember? When that kind of damage is done, only Jesus can heal it. Only Jesus can put the ear back and make it possible for them to hear again. Peter's intentions might have been right. Chopping off the ear. It's quite a thing. It's quite a thing. That's the first signature of Satan. Second signature of Satan. When you know it's Satan doing the talking. Verse 28, they led Jesus, therefore, from Caiaphas into the Praetorium. It was early, and they themselves did not enter into the Praetorium in order that they might not be defiled, but might eat the pestle, Passover, Paschal Seder. Again, they couldn't come, come into a pagan hall of judicial judgment. They would have been... Lo tahor, ritually defiled for the, for the Seder. Because it's, it had the idols of the Roman gods of justice and things like this. Pilate therefore went out to them and said, 
What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Pilate therefore said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews, again, the Judeans, not Jewish people, but the religious establishment and those they control, Judeo from the Greek, said to him, we're not permitted to put anyone to death. What accusation do you bring? What did he say that's not true? What did he say that's false? If he were not an evil man, we wouldn't have told you so. When you see this, no matter who is talking, it may be the voice of a human, but it's the words of Satan. Ad hominem attack. Circumventing the issue by attacking the person. Character assassination. Don't deal with the issue. When the court of Zedekiah could not deny what Jeremiah was saying, they attacked him for saying it. Martin Luther ended rather badly. In fact, very badly. But he began right. When he published the 95 Thesis, nailing it to the Wittenberg door in Germany, the Pope issued what was known as a papal bull. Good name for it. It was all bull. Wrote it in Latin. A boar has trampled thy vineyard, O Lord. Not one of the 95 Thesis was contested. They didn't deny what Luther said about the sale of indulgences. That's how they built the Vatican. The Vatican was built on that kind of blood money. Tetzel, the Dominican. When a coin into a box rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Oh, your mother died and she's saying, Sonny, get me out of here. You want your mother to be in purgatory? She's begging. That's how they built the Vatican. That's how it was funded. Luther heard Tetzel give a sermon, a fundraising sermon. He was the Kenneth Copeland of his day. He said, you can sexually violate Mary, the mother of Jesus, and be forgiven if you came up with the right price. He actually preached that. That's how they built St. Peter's in Rome. They couldn't deny what Luther was saying, so they attacked him for saying it. The Sanhedrin could not refute what Jesus was saying. So they attacked him for saying it. What charge do you bring against him? What accusation? Oh, he's no good. If he wasn't no good, we wouldn't have told you. He's wicked because we told you he was wicked. It's always something nebulous. Never something direct. It's he has a critical spirit. Hebrews 4.12 we're commanded to have a critical spirit. If you don't have a critical spirit, there's something wrong with you. Not a fault-finding critical spirit, but using the word of God to divide truth from error. If you don't have a critical spirit, I'm not saying if you don't have a critical spirit, you're going to be deceived. I'm saying if you don't have a critical spirit, you're deceived already. Test all things. One of the deceivers Satan raised up in your country, John Arnott from Toronto. I remember him on the tape. Don't question it. Don't try to judge it. Just jump into the water and experience it. <laughs> Would you take a high dive off a cliff into a pool without knowing how deep it was? Suspend all critical faculties. That's dangerous. You say it's wrong. You have a critical spirit. When you see ad hominem attack, when you see somebody going after the individual in order to circumvent what they're saying, in order to dodge and evade the issues, that is a person who is speaking of the devil.
They are speaking from the devil. That's the second signature. One of the things I learned from Marsh Rosen, the founder of Jews for Jesus, was this. Unsaved Jewish people are going to attack you. They're going to ridicule you. They're going to mock you. They're going to tell you that you're an idiot, that you hate your own people, that you hate the Jews, that you're this, you're that, you're no better than a Nazi. The response? You're right. Jacob Prash is a reprobate. He's reprehensible. That man is deplorable. He's brash. He's horrific. He's not the kind of guy you'd want your daughter to marry. He is absolutely detestable. Now that we have that settled, can we please deal with the issue? <laughs> what about what he's saying? When you see people avoiding the issues by attacking the personality, the devil is speaking through them. Cognizantly or otherwise. Third signature of Satan. Let's look. Story continues. Verse 38. Pilate said to him, what is truth? When you have this, you got a problem. Relativism. You will get Theological relativism? You will get philosophical relativism. What you will end up with moral relativism. Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Scripture is absolute doctrinal truth. What is scripture? The word became flesh. I am the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is not simply somebody who knew the truth. He's not even just the personification of truth. He is it's truth incarnate. It's absolute. What is truth? When they go into relativism, Paul tells us if Christ is not risen, we're the most foolish of all men. If the history, historicity of the resurrection is not an objective fact, we're stupid for being here. Paul says if Christ is not as risen, we should be down in a nightclub with the world partying all night. We should be living a debaucherous, reprobate life. We should be given to nihilism. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we'll be buried if Christ is not risen. Christianity depends on the proposition that Jesus historically rose from the dead, the historicity of the resurrection narrative. And the rest of scripture. One of Satan's mouthpieces today, one of the servants of Satan today, a man who works for the devil, who performed the same sex marriage for his son and his son's husband, is Brian McLaren, the emergent church guru. And McLaren wrote his book, A Generous Orthodoxy, in which he declares. Christianity is not about propositional truth, and it never was. He is a liar. 
He is of his father, the devil. It is a propositional fact that Jesus rose from the dead. If that's not true, nothing else matters. What is truth? People like Tony Campolo compromising on homosexuality. Another winner. No, he's a loser. If he doesn't repent on the day of judgment, he'll find out. This thing? Oh, that was for then. Campola actually says, this is what he says, the red letter Bible, everything is subordinated to the words of Jesus. Jesus never taught against homosexuality, only Paul did. It's not in the red letters, only the black letters, so we can't be so dogmatic. That's his teaching. Campola's son Barth is worse. He says, is there anything in scripture that legislates against homosexuality? I will either ignore it or spiritualize it away. Last week, Desmond Tutu said he'd rather go to hell than go to the heaven of a homophobic God. Well, he'll get his wish. He doesn't repent. Now understand this. Uh, all scripture is inspired, Paul says. It's all God read. Not only that, but Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach the apostles. Remind them of all he taught us. In other words, the epistles are inspired commentary. We read the rest of Scripture through the prism of the apostles' writings, the epistles. If you want to understand the Olivet Discourse, read Thessalonians. If you want to understand the Gospel, read Romans. If you want to know what the Gospel is, read Romans. If you want to know what the Gospel isn't, read Galatians. The epistles explain the rest of Scripture. What did Jesus mean? The apostles will tell us what he meant. Campola says, no, if it's not in the red letters, we can't be so dogmatic. Jesus never specifically said anything about homosexual. That is the devil. He was speaking from Satan. Oh, he's a good brother. No, he's not. To be a tzaddik, you must be tzaddik. Oh, that was for then. It all becomes relativistic. That's how it works. Quite a thing. Quite a thing indeed. Well, let's go further with this. The fourth Signature of Satan. Let's look at it synoptically in Matthew chapter 26. Verse 59, now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order that they might put him to death. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, This man stated, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? When he said that, in context, he was speaking about the temple of his body, wasn't he? Fourth signature of Satan. This is a big one. You already know it. A text out of context, an isolation from co-text is a pretext. That's not what he said in context. Sometimes Satan only has to change 
One word of one verse. Augustine of Hippo came along and rewrote Christianity as a platonic religion in order to accommodate Constantine's politicization of the church to try to artificially use it to buttress the corroding, crumbling Roman Empire. In the parables of the kingdom, the parable of the wheat and pears, Jesus says, no, don't go out and do it now. Let the wheat and pears grow up together. And then he says, here's the parable. The field is the world. Augustine, better known as Augie the Doggy, founder of both the Roman Catholic cult and the Reformed Calvinist cult, said, the world is the church. He changes one word. So now the church is made up of the saved and unsaved. You're not born again to get into it. You're simply a citizen of the empire. Luther comes along and writes quius regio, aeus religio. Whatever your government is, your religion should be. Now, I don't think all Calvinists are members of a cult, but Calvinism is cultic. It follows the teachings of a man, not of the word of God. He changes one word. One word. Sprinkle the babies. Make it the equivalent of circumcision, a state church. Change one word. Rodney Howard Brown from South Africa. Remember him? The laughing drunken revival. Changes one word. First Corinthians chapter two. Verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Notice it's the natural man. Unsaved people cannot accept the things of the spirit of God. That's the natural man. People who are unregenerate, who don't have the spirit of Jesus, who are not born again. That's true, the natural man, he changes one word. When they're all laughing and falling down, drunk in hysterics, he says, don't try to understand it, don't try to judge it. The natural mind does not understand the things of God. He changes one word. We have to have the mind of Christ. Text out of context and isolation from co-text is a pretext. Sometimes the devil only has to arrange for somebody to change one word to put the church on the wrong road. I hate to say anything good about the devil, but he certainly knows his job. Well, let's understand this. Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 is the heart of the New Testament teaching, doctrinally, concerning the relationship of the church to Israel and the Jews. The prophetic and salvific purposes of God for Israel and the Jews relative to the church is the theme of Romans 9, 10, and 11. Romans 11, if the natural branches, the Jews believe in Jesus, he will graft them back in again. And in the last days, Paul says it will happen. Now let's look at Romans 9 and see what has been done with this. This morning we looked at transubstantiation from John 6. The whole thing's out of context, isn't it? Well, it's not only the Roman church that does that. 
Let's look. Romans 9. Verse 10. And not only this, but there was Rivka, Rebecca also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose, according to his election, electos, choice, might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power to you, in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You'll say to me, why does he find fault? Who can resist his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common? There it is! Predestination! Calvinism, he makes some people to go to heaven and he makes some people to go to hell. It's all his election. Who are you to argue? He's the potter with the clay. They weren't even born yet. One he loved and the other he hated. There it is. Black and white. Reformed theology. That's what they say. To this day, evangelism is difficult in Ireland because of what the Calvinists did to the Irish. John Wesley went to Ireland 18 times and said, this is the way Protestants treat Catholics. No wonder these people don't want to get saved. South Africa, the Dutch Reformed Church, were the elect, not the black people. The American South, the Southern Baptists, were the elect. Notice anywhere you ever had a strong Calvinistic influence permeating the social fabric. You have a history of injustice perpetrated in the name of Christ. The Taliban, the Mutawa in Saudi Arabia, the religious police. Look at Calvin's Geneva or Puritan England. They did the same thing as the Taliban because they come from the same place. Islam calls it Inja Allah. Everything that happens is Allah's perfect will, says Islam. Protestantism calls it Calvinism. Predestination. The reason they did the same things as the Taliban is they have the same beliefs. In Mother Britain, the English Puritan Calvinists and the Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists massacred each other in the name of Jesus Christ. Christian jihad. Why do they do the same thing as the Taliban? Because they have the same beliefs. Everything that happens, good or bad, is God's perfect will. There it is in Romans that proves that he makes some for heaven, some for hell. He makes some reprobate. Makes God the author of evil. Now let's look at the context of Romans 9, 10, and 11. When you get to chapter 11, you see in verse 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, the patriarchs. It's not talking about the election of individuals. It's talking about the election of nations. How do you know that? Try reading it. Who 
two twins are in your womb. No. It quotes Rebecca from the book of Genesis, all right. But what does God say to Rebecca? Let's read it. Don't take my word for it. Let's go to Genesis chapter 25. Verse 23, and the Lord said to her, two sons are in your womb? Two twins are in your womb? No, two nations are in your womb. The theological term is a corporate solidarity, where one person represents a larger group of people. They're the personification of the Jewish and Arab nations, Jacob and Esau respectively. Pharaoh is a corporate solidarity of Egypt. And the election is not salvation. Israel was elected to be Orla Goyim, the lights to the nations. They were elected because through them would come the scriptures and the Messiah through which God would reconcile fallen man back to himself. Election has to do with service, not personal salvation. In Ephesians, you are elect. Yeah, it's plural. It doesn't say people are elect as individuals. We are elect. If you're a believer, you're elect. <laughs> because you're part of an elect people. <laughs> you understand? If an individual Jew rejected the Messiah, they'd be cut off from their own tree. They would no longer be part of the elect people unless they repented. It's not about individuals, it's about a nation. Additionally, it is not about salvation per se, it's about calling. Romans 11.29, the gifts and calling of God go forth without repentance. Well, what about the potter and the clay? Good question, let's try reading it. Turn to Jeremiah 18, because Romans 9 is Paul's exegesis of Jeremiah 18. Let's read Jeremiah 18. Here's the text, here's the context, here's the co-text. Let's look at it. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise, go to the potter's house, there I'll speak my words to you. I went to the potter's house and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as the potter does, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I might speak concerning an individual. No. I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull it down. If that nation against which I've spoken turns from its evil, I'll relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. Or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or a kingdom to build up, to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, I will think better of the good with which I promised to bless it. The text in context, in light of the co-text in both Romans and Jeremiah, is speaking about election of nations, not individuals. Like Augustine, like Rodney Brown, they only have to change one word and give it a completely different meaning 
alien to the text and the context. So now it becomes a God of love who wants none to perish, but all should reach repentance. He creates people to torture them forever. Now he's omniscient. He's outside of time. He foreknows who's going to be saved and who isn't. That's for sure or he wouldn't be God. But it's not arbitrary. Look what he says. He says, if the nation turns away from me, then I'll crush it. But if they repent, I'll forgive them. <laughs> what does it say in Romans 11? If he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. But if they repent, I'll take them back. He doesn't arbitrarily decide to send people to hell. It's based on their actions. And he's always preferring to forgive. They do a hatchet job on the text. It's not nations, not people, and it's not an arbitrary judgment. Additionally, notice, he makes something else out of the same pot, doesn't he? He doesn't throw it away and get some new clay. He makes something else out of the old clay. Jeremiah 31, 31. I will make, literally, I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the one I made with their fathers. The new covenant will be made with Israel and the Jews. Paul says so in Romans chapter 9 as well. To them belongs, in Greek, present, continuous, active, still belongs, diatite, covenants. Both the old and the new belong to the Jews. Jesus never made a covenant with the church. Never. The church has no covenant of its own. The new covenant was initiated, inaugurated, as an ancient Near Eastern suzerainty ritual, at a Paschal Seder. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, says Jeremiah, and Paul quotes them. If God is finished with the Jews, he's automatically finished with the church because the church has no covenants. Fortunately, the validity of a covenant never depends on the unfaithfulness of man, but only the fidelity of God. Let no false teacher tell you otherwise. If God is finished with the Jews, he's finished with the church. Well, let's look. Take the text out of context, make it a pretext. Instead of about nations, it becomes about individuals. Instead of about of you repent, I'll forgive you, but if you don't repent, I'm going to bring judgment. No, no, he just arbitrarily decides. There are sincere people who believe this reformed rubbish. Philosophically, Calvinism is not Judeo-Christian. It is Islamic. It is not scriptural. It is a Quranic belief. How do they get it? Text, out of context, an isolation from code text is a pretext. One more verse. Turn with me, please, to Second Timothy. I'm sorry, First Timothy chapter two, verse three. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. That's a Christological statement. It affirms the deity of Christ. Who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. No, all men just means the elect, say the Calvinists. What are the other people? Kangaroos? Notice something. Remember, both Reformed theology and Roman Catholicism and Lutheranism come from Augustine. Augustine was a, 
Augustine. Luther was an Augustinian monk. Neither Roman Catholicism or real Reformed Calvinism can give people the assurance of salvation. Roman Catholics are doing works to try to get saved. Hyper-Calvinists are doing works to try to prove they are saved. Neither one can give the assurance of salvation. We do works because we've been saved, not to get saved. These things are forms of mental illness. They're nuts. One more. When this stuff happens, certain things happen. But the ultimate consequence of it is again in the trials of Jesus in John 18. Give us Barabbas, Barabbas in Aramaic, son of the father. He was a member of the ones Josephus called the Sikkim. We translated zealots. They were sort of like the UVF or the IRA in Northern Ireland. They're basically gangsters and terrorists who misuse religion as a political banner to carry out repression of their own people. If you read Josephus' Wars of the Jews, what these people did to their own people was worse than the Romans. They treated their own people worse than the Romans did. This was not a nice guy. Now, there's more we could say about Barabbas than this. We have a tape explaining it. Nonetheless, let's understand this. Who do you want me to release to you? Charlie Manson? Or Jesus, give us Barabbas. What about this rabbi who taught love and forgiveness and peace, who raised a little girl from the dead and made blind people see and deaf people hear and lame people walk and whose message was based on love and forgiveness and righteousness? What should I do with Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef? Min had said it. Crucify. That was done by the foreordained plan of God and God's gambit against Satan to bring us salvation, but it shows something. We are told that Satan knew God would raise him from the dead. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. As Isaiah put it, Woe to them who call good evil. And they call evil good. That is the final signature of Satan. If you oppose non-therapeutic abortion, the mainstream media, the academic institutions, the politicians, they say you're the evil one. Forget about the medical realities. You're the evil one. You say homosexuality is unnatural, it reduces human longevity? You're a homophobe. You refuse to subscribe to the lie that Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance when they cannot show you one country in the world. Of the 57 Muslim countries in the world, they cannot show you one where Christians and Jews have the same rights as Muslims have in Canada. If you don't believe the lie, you're intolerant. They call good evil and evil good. But what happens when this is in the church? If you speak up and tell the truth about right doctrine and discernment, you have a critical spirit, you're judgmental, you don't love the brethren. <laughs> they call good evil. They call evil good. When the world does it, that's the world. But when it happens in the church, 
When the ear is chopped off, that's the devil. When there's an ad hominem attack, circumventing the issue by going after the individual, that's the devil. When the absolute nature of scriptural truth is replaced by relativism, what is truth? That's the devil. When a text is taken out of context and isolation from co-text to support a pretext, that's the devil. And when people begin to call good evil and evil good, that's the devil. Those are the signatures of Satan. When he speaks through unsaved people, that's easy discernment. But to understand when he's speaking through Christians, to understand when he raises his voice in the church, that's difficult discernment. He is a master deceiver. In the last days, these deceptions will multiply greatly and are already doing so. That's the bad news. The good news is that if we hold fast to the Lord Jesus, he doesn't have to deceive us. That's the way it was. That's the way it is, and that's the way it's going to be until Jesus comes. Praise God, he is coming soon. God bless.